Hello again, and it's uh, another episode of In Conservation with I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. And I always forget to do this, but actually I don't forget to do it, but I never do it straight away. I normally sort of forget or remember 10 minutes into the conversation, but tonight is sponsored um, by Leica Sport Optics and also by the tourism board that looks after the northern province of Extremadura in southwest Spain and they're called the Depitafion de Cathras. So thank you guys for sponsoring tonight. Um, I hope you're all well and having a, a good life at the moment. Um, my guest tonight um, is suggesting that if we do one or two things more, we can have an even better life. And I actually, to be honest with you, agree with him. Um, tonight, I'm really happy to have Peter Cairns with us, um, who, amongst other thing, things is a photographer and writer, but is also someone who founded Scotland, The Big Picture, which is a rewilding charity which works to drive the recovery of nature across Scotland. So I've actually had the pleasure of seeing or meeting Peter, but also seeing him deliver um, his talk on rewilding. And I'll tell you what, it's much more, it's, a very, it's actually very different to what I imagined. And I hope that you come away from this tonight um, or if you watch this in the future, come away from seeing the video um, with a different uh, view on rewilding. But Peter, welcome along. Um, the question I need to ask you is, how are you and where are you? Yeah, evening, David. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm very well, uh, first up, and I'm at home just outside Aviemore in the Scottish Highlands. And you were telling me before we came on air that it's chilly in Spain, but I can trump you, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, it really does feel like snow is about to fall here, even though we're in April. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to hear no nonsense about it being being cold in Spain. The thing is, I think I'm getting used to people moaning around here because from England, being from England, you know, I, I it's not cold at all. But you you kind of get lulled into this whole idea of it being cold. I don't think it's snowed in this particular city for about 20, 25 years. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we've got a long way to go there. But of course, we know each other. Uh, we've known each other for a few years. I mean, I actually first met you or came in contact with you when you contacted me about one of your projects, which was a 2020 vision. Do you remember that? Yeah, no, I remember it, yeah. For those who don't know, what, what was 2020 vision about? Um, well, I guess I guess it, it was about rewilding, although it wasn't called rewilding then. It was, it was really, um, we, we brought together 20 photographers to celebrate what was at the time, and I'm going back to about 2012 now, the evolving concept of ecological restoration, holistic ecosystem recovery at a landscape scale, which was really just starting to, to take root in the UK at that time. Um, as I say, it's gone on and evolved and matured and it's now sort of recognised as rewilding, but 2020 Vision was my sort of first toe in the water really in terms of that particular story. And that's also when I realized that you were a photographer and what's interesting about your photography or that your thoughts on photography is that you, number one, don't call yourself or don't think of yourself as a photographer, despite the fact you take amazing pictures. And by the way, I'm sure Maya has put um, Peter's um, website in the chat so you can check it out, but you take some incredible pictures. You don't call yourself a photographer and you also mentioned that the geeky stuff is boring and you know what that struck a chord with me not that i'm a photographer either even though i'm billed as one um i kind of i've never been able to understand I mean, for me taking a picture is very organic you just you know look through the camera and take a picture and you, you compose it what have you in your head and i always subscribe to the thought but you, you, you can't buy the eye but tell me why you feel it's all a bit geeky yeah, I mean, I don't mean that in any in any disrespectful way to any photographers out there, but I think in the UK, maybe in the US as well, um, nature photography has always been looked upon as quite a technical discipline, and a technical discipline needs the technology to serve that technical discipline. So we tend to get a bit obsessed with gear, lenses, camera bodies, all the usual settings. That that stuff has never never really interested me. For for me, photography has always been a creative process, a storytelling process. And, and so from that point of view, it doesn't matter what lens you've got in your hand or what camera body you've, you, you can afford, um, that, that, that's just a tool. That's just a, a currency 
through which you, you produce imagery. So yeah, I, I mean, photography itself, I, I'm not interested in. What I am interested in is what photography can do. And what photography can do, what the image can do, the visual image can do is, is make you think. It can make you think differently and it can make you feel differently. It can tell you a story. It's a currency that transcends age, background, culture. Everybody understands what, what a visual image is and, and what it's saying to you. So yeah, the, the reason I say I'm not a photographer is I'm not a photographer in the conventional sense, I guess, um, from a technical point of view, but, but I'd like to think that I'm very interested or have been previously in the historically in the, in the creative process. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, I, there's so many people now taking pictures and, you know, I've been a judge on various phot phot photographic uh, competitions and I've always felt a bit of a fraud in many respects, but then I realized actually it is about storytelling. It is about actually, you know, the, the idea behind what's going on, you know, in the image. So yeah, very fascinating. But we're here to talk about the whole idea of um, rewilding. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, is rewilding the, the word? Is that is that still a, a thing or is it now moved on to another kind of, you know, adjective to describe exactly what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting word, um, and and I've spent many, many, many hours um, debating what it means and what it is and what it isn't. Um, I, I'll, I'll skip that. I think I think what's important for us in the word rewilding is that it 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 underlines. Well, first of all, it captures people's imagination, especially the younger generation, and that, that's important because I think what it does is signifies hope or symbolizes hope. Um, and that's what we do, really, at Scott in the Big Picture. We, we sell hope in, in, a, in a roundabout way. Um, but I think it, 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 it underlines the scale and urgency of nature recovery that is required. And I think if we use another term, nature recovery, ecological restoration, habitat repair, whatever you want to call it, for us, that just allows too much wiggle room for dilution. It allows us to default to a, to a compromised position, lacking the ambition that we think is necessary. So rewilding does has it, have its detractors. It has all sorts of preconceptions associated with it, some of which I'll talk about tonight. Um, but for us, it just, it just captures the essence of the scale and urgency needed. And that's why we, that's why we stick by it. Okay, because it's interesting. I've been hearing the term wilding now for urban areas, <laughs> which well, I suppose I think, kind of makes sense in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, we're not precious about what, what, what you call it. It, it. It's all about rolling our sleeves up and getting the job done. I think the rebit, if, if you like, it, it, it perhaps implies in some people's minds a return to something in the past, trying to recreate some sort of Disneyland utopia from, from a, an arbitrary point in history. And of course, we can't do that even if we wanted to. So the, the rebit is a little bit of negative baggage that the word has to carry with it. But wilding is you know, just as good and just as apt. Great. Well, I think that's a perfect um, point now to actually see your presentation and hear what you interpret rewilding as, especially in Scotland. Okay. So. For those for those watching um, and not experienced with this kind of thing, it's best to watch it um, on uh, speaker view so you can see the entire um, screen of the presentation. Yeah, you don't want my thumbnail stuck in the top right hand corner, or, or David's for that matter. Okay, so yeah, thanks very much indeed for inviting me along. As David said, my name is Peter Cairns. Um, my, my rather pretentious title is Executive Director of Scotland the Big Picture. Um, we're a charity that works to drive the recovery of nature across Scotland through rewilding in response to the growing biodiversity um, and climate crises. So our job is to make rewilding happen. We try to do that in four different ways. Um, we drive support for rewilding, we commit more land and water to rewilding, we return missing species, and we develop rewilding business models or, or enterprise models. So that's what we do, um, but I'm not here to talk about the charity, I'm here to talk about the, the principles behind Scotland the Big Picture, or maybe the story behind Scotland the Big Picture. So Scotland, this is a, this is a country hewn from rock that spewed from lava millions of years ago, dramatic, untamed, 
our peaks and ridges offer breathtaking views, thrilling challenges, and for some people, life-changing experiences. I've never met anyone who would contest that Scotland is a truly spectacular country with some truly awe-inspiring, globally recognised wild landscapes. And of course, in those landscapes lives some very special wildlife, wildlife that at a, at a conservation level is both nationally and internationally important. Wildlife that prospers as well in Scotland as it does anywhere across its natural range. Wildlife that has staged a remarkable comeback, like the osprey, of course, like the pine martin, after centuries of habitat loss and persecution. Wildlife that has negotiated the very turbulent political waters of an official reintroduction, like the beaver, of course. Some of Scotland's wildlife is maybe surprising. We maybe don't associate Scottish waters with humpback whales, with orcas, with basking sharks, but they're all here. Some species, they just make our pulse race. They ignite our imaginations. They bring our senses alive. Whose day isn't brightened up by a close encounter with a wild animal? And so Scotland is home to an incredible diversity of plants, insects, birds and mammals, some rare, some common, some threatened, some in recovery, some spectacular, some barely visible. When we look at these images or images like these, all can seem well. And yet this apparent wealth of life belies a hidden reality. And it's a reality that very few of us see and we don't see because we don't look. We don't know how to look. We're not conditioned to look. Now, Scotland, the big picture, never set out to tell people what to think. I hope we're not that stupid or arrogant. But what we do try to do is at least encourage people to look. So this is a landscape that I'm sure many of you recognise. This is the um, Kirang on the Isle of Skye. In many ways, this is the idealised Scotland, the cliched Scotland, the Scotland celebrated in tourist brochures. I've stood many a time at the Kerrang and listened to people around me marvel at the view. And it is one hell of a view. For most people, this landscape or something very similar to it symbolises what Scotland looks like, what they feel Scotland should look like. And yet, for the most part, these, these geological wonders are surrounded by an ecological desert. Gone are the complex woodlands that once shaped this land. Gone are the animals that once lived on this land. And gone too are many of the people that used to live from this land. Despite their unquestionable beauty and drama, many of Scotland's mountains, glens and rivers have become ecological vacuums, lying dormant, muted, some might say dying. There's an illness that has taken hold and we all suffer from it to varying degrees. And it's a condition that has led to Scotland becoming one of the most nature depleted countries in the world in terms of the biodiversity that we've lost. It's a condition called ecological blindness. And many of us suffer from ecological blindness. We don't see the degraded landscapes and the animals we've lost because we're not conditioned to look. This is a a quote from Gus Routledge, one of our trustees, and Gus is right, most people don't see the need to fix our landscapes because they don't perceive that they're broken. There's a sort of generational amnesia that has set in, whereby each new generation accepts and celebrates the landscape they're born into, irrespective of how impoverished it might be. So our perception is that this landscape is beautiful and dramatic because we're told it's beautiful and dramatic and we know no different. We've never seen anything different. The truth is that many of us suffer from ecological blindness. It's said that a red squirrel could once travel from Lockerbie in the south to Loch Inver in the north without ever touching the ground. But I think we all instinctively know that's not been possible for decades, maybe even centuries. Scotland's native pine woods have been reduced to just 84 tiny fragmented islands covering just 3% of their natural range, effectively imprisoning species like red squirrels, crested tits, capercaillie, species that are dependent on forest corridors and networks. But this is not just a story about the loss of trees. For any living system to function properly, 
there needs to be a community of species that built needs to work together and build that system, build and maintain that system, the plants, the insects, the micro life that provides the foundation for all life. And over time, it's that foundation, the ecological engine, if you like, that's been eroded and dismantled. Centuries of ecological decline have led to the complex living systems upon which we all depend to falter, and some might say fail. So we've arrived at a point where we celebrate, cherish, and even pay to actively conserve landscapes that serve the needs of just a few species and just a few people. And this is where we've got to. We've lost all our large carnivores, most of our large herbivores, and if we're honest, we spend our time in conservation circles, scrabbling around, trying to hold on to the fragments and threads of nature that we have left. Species that were once prolific, that now teeter on the edge. In 2019, the latest State of Nature report was published. And in it, there was a measure, a barometer, if you like, from, taken from 218 countries worldwide that were measured for their biodiversity intactness. That's the completeness of their nature. 218 countries globally, and this is where the UK came, 189. We're one of the most educated and affluent countries in the world, and yet somehow we've become one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. It doesn't have to be this way. People in the past, they made choices, sometimes good, sometimes bad. It's irrelevant, it's history. We can't change history, but we can use the past to help inform the future and help us answer this key question. What should Scotland look like? And I think this is a question that needs answering because 189 is not a great place to be. We can no longer bury our heads in the sand and assume all is well. Nature is in serious decline and we all need to make choices. And perhaps the worst choice we can make is to sit back and do nothing. So I have a, a, a few um, sort of heroes, if you like, in the, in the conservation world, people like uh, John Muir um, and a guy called Aldo Leopold. Some of you might know Aldo Leopold, not personally, but his reputation. Uh, he was an American hunter turned conservationist. I'd just like to read you a passage that Leopold wrote. We were eating lunch on a high rim rock when we saw what we thought was a doe fording a torrent. When she climbed the bank towards us, we realized our error, it was a wolf. In those days, we'd never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf, and in a second, we were pumping lead. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down. We reached her in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes. I was young back then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant fewer deer, that meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing that green fire die, I sense that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Now that experience caused Leopold to rethink his relationship with the wild world, to reconsider the importance of predators in the balance of nature. He called his new philosophy thinking like a mountain and it was something of a turning point in American conservation history. Leopold wrote this piece in 1949 around about the same time that ospreys returned to breed in Scotland and again this was something of a turning point. Here we have the unaided return of a bird that had been persecuted to extinction some 70 years previously. Now the ospreys return fueled a new appetite for conservation that very quickly spread across society. Now this, this is a majestic bird of prey, there's no doubt about that, but actually it was its story that captured the public's imagination. This was a species that had bounced back against the odds, a symbol of hope, a glimpse perhaps into what else might be possible with a change in people's attitudes. Well here we are 70 odd years on and ospreys have really pioneered conservation attitudes across the UK. This bird, probably more than any other, has shown that we can think like a mountain. Thinking like a mountain 
recognises that apex predators are essential to healthy ecosystems, but no more so than the tiniest of insects. It's the interaction and interdependency of all species that allows nature to work. Now today, there's another word for thinking like a mountain. It's called rewilding. And I think it's fair to say that, thanks to the popular press, um, rewilding has become synonymous with the return of large, scary carnivores, farmers getting driven off their land, all those lazy, lurid headlines that you read in the press. That's not how rewilding should be defined. For me, it starts with another quote, this time from Doug Chadwick, a renowned wildlife biologist who says, the essence of nature is wholeness, a wholeness woven from infinite complexity. Trying to save nature piece by piece doesn't make sense, even if we had all the time in the world, and we most certainly do not. But for all the time I've been in conservation, we've been trying to save nature piece by piece, species by species, red squirrels, corn crakes, capercaillie, water bowls, wildcats, brown hares, seabirds. At one time or another, we've had a go at saving them all. A rare species here, a fragment of habitat there. And there have been successes. There's no doubt about that. Yet across Scotland, across the UK, that wholeness that Doug Chadwick referred to remains broken. We seem unable to acknowledge that we're all bound up in an intricate web of life that ties us to the weather, the seas, the tides, the soils, the plants, the insects, and every other living creature on the planet. We still don't really think like a mountain. And if we're honest, we all make value judgments about so-called good and bad animals, those that are somehow more worthy of saving than others. Saving bits and bobs, fragments and threads of nature is not enough. We need to rebuild the whole. But to do this, we need to see the big picture. We need to think big and we need to think bold. We need to think beyond those tiny green boxes that are our nature reserves and stretch our imaginations to what might be possible rather than settling for what is easy or comfortable. We need rewilding. Rewilding is an opportunity to return abundance and diversity of life to our degraded ecosystems. It's an opportunity for Scotland to lead the way in transforming its land and sea so that they work in all their colorful complexity. It's an opportunity to stitch back together a tapestry of life where natural processes drive vibrant living systems. Processes like predator prey dynamics, like carcass scavenging, like birth, death, decay, regeneration. These are the processes that drive every healthy living system on the planet. Rewilding is about encouraging rivers shaded by corridors of alder and willow to run as they want to, as they need to, allowing natural debris like fallen trees to accumulate in river channels, enriching the water for insects and bird life, creating pools for rivers full of salmon and trout. Rewilding is about connectivity, encouraging native woodland to expand and regulate our climate and allowing animals the freedom to roam, creating wildlife highways for red squirrels to move from tree to tree. Rewilding is recognizing that a forest is not just a sea of trees, it's a complex community of soil microbes, lichens, mosses, tall trees, tiny trees, dead and dying trees, all coming together in a constantly evolving system. Rewilding is about re-wetting, restoring Scotland's peatlands that across huge areas have been drained and burned, giving them a chance to purify our water, to store carbon, as well as providing sanctuary for some of our most precious wildlife. Rewilding asks us all to think differently, to reconsider our place in the natural order as just one species among many. As much as anything, rewilding is a philosophical change in mindset, just as much as it is a physical change to the land and sea. And what about those large predators that so often hijack the rewilding conversation? This is a young sea eagle, uh, white-tailed eagle on a nest on the west coast. This is a descendant of birds that were reintroduced in the 1970s after we hunted this bird to extinction in 1918. So for me, allowing this young eagle 
a life free of persecution is a simple matter between right and wrong. And that too is part of rewilding. Britain is now just one of a handful of countries in Europe refusing to live with links. It's not that we can't, there's plenty of food, there's plenty of habitat, it's that we won't. Lynx, wolves and bears are now recolonizing mainland Europe, finding their way back to places where they've not been seen in generations. There are now wolves living in Spain, in Italy, in France, in Germany. There are now wolves living in the Netherlands of all places. So it's not that we can't, it's that we won't. There's a list of 24 countries, most of them much more industrialized, much more heavily populated than the Scottish Highlands, all of them have got on with the business of returning beavers to their wetlands. Germany now has 30,000 beavers, France 20,000. Now beavers are now back in Scotland, but it took 20 years. And for many people, they represent an imposition. Beavers are definitely not what Scotland should look like for those people. At its most basic level, rewilding is anything that counteracts more dewilding, anything that joins up and enriches habitats rather than further fragment and degrade them, anything that results in more wildlife and not less wildlife. And then ultimately, rewilding is about standing back, letting nature plot its own course, letting nature have its own way. Ultimately, rewilding is about letting go. But as a society, as a culture, letting go is not something we're particularly good at. Changing our thinking, taking on the principles of thinking like a mountain, it isn't easy for many people. People are weighed down by belief systems that form throughout their lives, through their parents, their education, their social background, their peer groups, even their religious persuasions. These things all shape what we believe to be right and wrong, who we are and what we stand for. This is an image of the um, trophy room, so-called trophy room at, at Mar Lodge on, on D side, showing off thousands of deer antlers. And in many ways, this image encapsulates the tension between two distinct beliefs. The belief that we're part of nature, just another species, and the belief that we're somehow superior, separate, here to act as owners or tamers of the wild. And that word wild is really interesting in, in Scotland because it can be problematic or uncomfortable for many people. The dictionary defines wild by what it's not, not cultivated, not civilized, uninhabited, inhospitable. Wild has come to be associated with the absence of people, echoes of the clearances, nature taking control. So rewilding, is seen by some as nothing more than a mechanism for getting rid of people and replacing them with the wild. But wild really shouldn't be about what it's not, it should be about what it gives us. And wild gives us clean air, fresh water, healthy soils, a stable climate. Without wild, none of us can survive. So if you think about it logically, if we can put aside some of our deep rooted cultural beliefs, our prejudices is really what they are. You could argue that at heart, we're all rewilders. The conflict between nature and people, it, it really shouldn't exist. Everyone agrees that a vibrant, healthy environment is a good thing. That's an absolute no brainer. The only thing we disagree on is exactly what that looks like and how we get there. So where does rewilding begin? Well, the easiest place to begin is with common ground. And you've only got to go back 70 years, one human lifetime, and red squirrels, thousands of red squirrels, tens of thousands of red squirrels were killed for a bounty. They were treated as vermin. Now today, that would be unthinkable. Everybody agrees that red squirrels are a valuable element of our woodlands. They're universally adored. Red squirrels were recently reintroduced into the Northwest Highlands as part of a rewilding project where they've not been seen in generations. And of course, they were welcomed with open arms. Why wouldn't they be? So if we can come together and change our attitudes and our perceptions of red squirrels, as we've done with ospreys, 
then surely we can do the same with other species. And from there, we can start to make different choices about what Scotland should look like. This really shouldn't be such a difficult question to answer. Rewilding, it's just a word. It's not something that we should be frightened of, but to make it work, we need to turn it from a perceived threat into an actual opportunity. And that means a huge shift in societal beliefs and attitudes. We need to look beyond land being valued solely according to what can be grown on it, or in the case of Scotland, how many, or large parts of Scotland, how many animals can be shot on it. I've only got to go back um, 10 years, may, maybe even five years, and I wouldn't have been able to show you these next images. But this is an animal that is now writing its own story in the history books. Pine martins were once Britain's second most common carnivore. Taken to the brink of extinction, their recovery in the last couple of decades shows what can be achieved. And the main thing that's changed is that we've stopped killing them. Our attitudes towards pine martins have allowed them to bounce back. Now, it is fair to say that not everyone welcomes the return of pine martins. I regularly have people telling me that there are now too many. But what does too many actually mean? When I ask those people how many pine martins there are, none of them know. But there are still too many pine martins, too many otters, too many badgers. What too many always, always means in their mind is more than they used to be. It's lazy thinking. And if as a society we accept that the future cannot rest with trying to save nature piece by piece, species by species, if we accept that wholeness, we can't pick and choose those animals that we like or profit from and discard the rest. So martins are really key to this rewilding journey because just like red squirrels and ospreys, they're a, a vital element of Scotland's ecology, but just as importantly, they're also symbolic of our changing attitudes, of our ability to think like a mountain. David Meek is a well-known um, wolf researcher in the States and he often says that wolves are neither saints nor sinners, except to those people who choose to make them so. And I don't think it's any different with pine martins or otters or white-tailed eagles or badgers. So if rewilding is such a good thing, why isn't it happening across more of Scotland? Well, bit by bit, it is. This is Cairngorms Connect, a 200 year vision to restore 600 square kilometers of forest, peatland, loch and river, right in the heart of the Cairngorms National Park. This is Glenfeshie, just three miles from where I'm sitting now. After centuries of intense management, predominantly for deer stalking and grouse shooting, this landscape is being allowed to breathe, to recover, to start to govern itself. Nature being allowed back on its own terms. And for the first time in a very long term time, the ancient pines on the valley floor have neighbours, sprightly young pines that are sitting next to their parents and grandparents. And already, after just a few short years, species that are threatened elsewhere are starting to show signs of recovery. Capercaillie, hen harriers, mountain hares, golden eagles. So Cairngorms Connect is bringing about ecological change at a landscape scale. But what is crucial here, what is crucial for all rewilding projects, not just in Scotland, but the world over, is that this wilding process is not at the expense of people. Rewilding does not mean de-peopling, quite the opposite. Jobs are already being created at Cairngorms Connect. Young people are being given the chance to forge a livelihood, a life, build a life in remote rural communities. It's not just in the Cairngorms where we're starting to think like a mountain. Just a few months ago, a major new initiative called Afric Highlands was signed to restore nature to 500,000 acres in the Scottish Highlands. Afric Highlands is a partnership that will link neighboring glens in a mosaic of forest, peatland, and restored wetland. A set of east-west corridors, if you like, that red squirrels will use as commuting routes, that sea eagles will use as flyways. 
And again, at the heart of this big nature idea is the opportunity to restore communities around and restored wild landscape. The opportunities to restore or revitalize, if you like, local economies on the back of a rewilded landscape. Craig Meggy in Loch Arbor is another rewilding landscape scale, rewilding initiative. Ditto Allerdale in Sutherland, ditto Ben A in Westeros, Koyak and Assent in the Northwest Highlands. None of these landscapes will transform overnight, but their rewilding journey has begun. And it's not just in the remote corners of the Highlands that rewilding or wilding is taking hold. This is the Cumbernauld Living Landscape Project just outside Glasgow where nature is being encouraged right into the heart of one of our busiest urban environments. I spoke earlier about connectivity being a key element of rewilding, making sure that animals can roam unimpeded across landscapes, that natural processes can play out uninterrupted. This wildlife bridge in the Netherlands shows what could connectivity could look like in a, in a modern human dominated or modified landscape if there was political will. So these are just a few of a growing list of rewilding projects, big and small, that hint at a, a new dawn. It's a new dawn that for me is full of hope for both wildlife and human life. We can do this rewilding stuff, we know how to do it. Increasingly we have the knowledge and the will. But some people question why. Why bother? Why try fixing something that isn't broken? Well, three reasons. Firstly, because right now nature is losing in a war with our insatiable appetite for economic growth. In my lifetime, the number of wild animals living on the planet has halved, whilst the number of humans living on the planet has doubled. Our climate is changing, and the very systems that underpin our existence are under threat. So actually, you don't need to give a hoot about pine martins, pine trees, or pine hoverflies. This stuff affects us all. We need wildness in our lives. There's now a growing body of compelling evidence that links a detachment from nature to a whole host of both physical and mental conditions, especially among young people. And I think the last two years has probably emphasized that need for a connection with nature. And there's a wider moral issue at work here. We've stripped our forests, we've drained our wetlands, we've eliminated many species that once lived here. These are all things that quite understandably we now condemn in other countries. And yet we sit in judgment on those countries, our moral integrity summed up by that figure of 189. Some people ask, can we afford to rewild? I think we would ask, can we afford not to? We need to find new ways to combat climate change and arrest and reverse the catastrophic loss of nature. And can we afford the human cost of a nature depleted Scotland? Can we afford not to rewild our uplands knowing that if we leave them bare, the potential for downstream flooding dramatically increases? And are we not closing our minds to the opportunities provided by species that many people think belong here? Not as ornaments, but as part of that wholeness. So as I said at the start, I can't tell you what to think. I can only ask you to look. And of course, we accept that not everyone buys into our vision of rewilding. But certainly in rural Scotland, for those people, we ask two questions. If not rewilding, then what? And if not now, then when? This is what hundreds of Scottish glens look like today. This is described as a cultural or a working landscape. But does this bare, sterile landscape really work for nature, for climate, and crucially, for people? Surely there's a better opportunity in a, in a more complex, diverse, multi-dimensional landscape. This is what this glen could look like. And we don't have to choose between nature and people. There is place and space for both. 
we live in a world where should is an overused word, should do this, should do that. In my experience, humans don't do shoulds very well. So perhaps we need to stop arguing about what Scotland should look like and summon up huge bundles of imagination to envisage what Scotland could look like. I believe Scotland could become a world leader in transforming its broken ecosystems, but it's people, it's all of us who ultimately hold the key to the rewilding door. It's people who will decide what Scotland should or could look like 200 years from now. What gets me out of bed every morning is the hope that we will all learn to see the big picture. So thank you for looking, thank you for listening. Um, we have a website, as you would expect, scotlandbigpicture.com. We'd be delighted to have you along on the journey. Of course, we're on all the social media channels as well. So do hook up with us. And yeah, now I'm gonna negotiate the terrifying prospect of getting back to, is that it? That's it, yeah. Fabulous as ever, Peter. Thank you so much for bringing this whole concept to our to our, our minds again basically something that you know a lot of people know the words but don't really understand what it means um and also great images including the uh, the otter with the puffin in this mouth that's incredible where was that taken that was one of richard shucksmith's one of my colleagues taken up in shetland fantastic but it, it seems to me that there's kind of two big groups of opposition in, in the UK. You know, you've got the, the landowners and the hunters, but you also got the, the public opinion as well. And I get the feeling, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is, do you think that people in Britain, um, because we haven't had apex predators for centuries, we've now grown used to not having them. And the very idea of having them, having them again, um, also kind of exasperated by the national press and what they have to say about it, makes people say, absolutely not. When, when you compare it to Europe, and as you say, people live side by side. I mean, obviously there are time, times when there are clashes, of course, but in the main side by side with some, you know, like the brown beer standing behind me, what is it, why is it so different in Britain? Or is it so? Um. Well, I would argue that physically it isn't different to many European countries, but culturally and psychologically, philosophically, it, it is. Um, and, and I think it's probably unfair to generalise and say that, you know, farmers, for example, are against predatory introduction and the public is, is, is for it. That's the common narrative uh, peddled by the media, that this, this idea that urban romantics want to see some sort of utopian countryside and those that are actually living there and affected by these issues don't get a voice. I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. So it, it is a complex and, and deep rooted um, issue revolving around very complex value systems, cultural tradition, economics, politics, that sense of identity. These things all play into that narrative. But we, we've just actually completed literally um, a week ago a, a year long um, social feasibility study into the willingness of Scotland to accommodate links. So effectively asking the question, should links come back? Um, and in broad brush terms, that there is majority support for links. In broad brush terms, it's about two thirds versus one third in favour. However, within that one third, there is a very, very vocal um, um, set of stakeholders who are not, um, who are absolutely opposed to, to apex predator reintroduction. And, and by the way, opposed to many facets of rewilding as well. And, and I think that it's not necessarily about lynx or beavers or trees or, or, or whatever. I think there are two factors that, that play into this. There's a fear of change, especially when they feel that change is being imposed upon them by outsiders. And there's also the fear of loss of control. And you, you touched upon this in your question. We are a country that has become accustomed to having control over every square inch of land. We determine which species live there, in what numbers, and to whose benefit. And rewilding 
to varying degrees is asking us to relinquish some of that control to nature, to let go. And that's unnerving for a culture that has had, you know, several hundred years, if not a thousand years, um, having absolute control. So I think there are some, I, I don't think it's necessarily about the species, it's maybe not even about rewilding, it's about some of these cultural perceptions and attitudes that are really, really entrenched in some quarters. That's interesting because I remember speaking to someone at the RSPB who told me a really interesting story surrounding lynx and their reintroduction to a forest just outside of Berlin. Um, apparently they built the hides from which you won't see lynx, because obviously they're, they're very secretive, and they told the local farmers, listen, we're doing this, we're, we're releasing the lynx on whatever date, um, here's some paperwork, uh, let us know of the numbers of, uh, of your livestock that have been either killed or injured by by lynx and we will um you know we'll refund you whatever appropriately so a year later the farmers come back massive wads of paper saying about you know all the lambs and stuff they lost and the people that organized it said that's interesting because we haven't actually reintroduced the lynx yet so as you say there's there's this thing there's this it's like, you know, they're villains, you know, if you if you bring in, I don't understand, by the way, just to jump the subject slide, I don't understand what the opposition to Beaver was. What's the opposition? Well, again, I th I, a range of complex um, issues, but but uh, again, I think it's it's change, it's 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 unruliness, untidiness, lack of control. Be and in the case of beavers in Scotland, there were some elements of, of the beaver population that was illegally reintroduced that's another story for another day but but again the feeling that this has been done to people rather than for people and, and with people so there's that feeling of resentment that that in 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 the case of beavers manifested with beavers but actually it wasn't about beavers it was about that sense of loss of control um and that you know that persists e even today so yeah it's a chat all of this stuff is a challenge and um i think you know change in land use has always been a challenge and probably always will be. I think, you know, what you're saying about Scotland is such a, a great vision and I just don't understand why that just can't happen. I mean, from the from the heart of Glasgow, Edinburgh, spreading out into the middle of nowhere in the Highlands, it just makes complete sense. When I visit places like Northern Europe and Eastern Europe, you know, they seem to be much more in harmony with nature. I mean, uh, in Helsinki, you know, there's a forest or the forest actually is in the city as well. You know, there's areas of just natural forest and people have grown up to actually see this and realize, you know, this is part of what we are. I just, you know, I despair like many conservationists. I despair when I look around and people would prefer to see concrete, would prefer to knock down a block of woods to put a railway line through it. I mean, I just don't understand you know, do they not know where this is all leading to? Because you've alluded to it in your in your talk, you know, climate change and all the other benef benefits that we could have had in terms of seeing green and blue are now lost and it's to our detriment. Why don't people understand it? And I'm asking the same question all the time, but it just, it just frustrates me. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, I, and I mean, just picking up on something you said there, David, um, you know, I would argue people do tend to tribalize and 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 simplify these these debates. So I hear a lot. You know, it's all those gamekeepers, it's all those farmers, it's all those landowners. You know, that that has some truth in it, but it's it's not realistic to generalize. And I have to say that that some of the opposition, significant opposition, to the principles of rewilding, many of which I've tried to explain this evening, come from the conservation community itself. You know, which I think is inherently, dare I say it, small-minded, lacking in ambition, um, inherently risk-averse. So, you know, we 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 tie ourselves. We, we, I would argue that conservation has become paralysed by fear and process, and and that again is a difference. I think with some European organisations, they don't have that same level of of of, of risk aversion. And, and, and when you have risk aversion and a lack of ambition, inertia sets in and nothing ever happens. Now, that's a massive broad brush generalization. Uh, and I'm not wishing to criticize conservation across the board. But there are there are bodies out there who are in a position to do much 
much more and for various reasons choose not to and that's a and, frustration of mine as well yeah i've i've i mean in my capacity you know going out and and being an educator and actually working with a lot of these bodies i too have seen that i've seen um ngos that are very bland very conservative and as you say not creative and i worry because i think to myself these bodies are also influencing the next batch of conservationists but in in their form gray you know no mavericks you know we need people out there to 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 express what 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 needs to be done you know as opposed to i mean for example i remember recently um i gave um i was at the um it's like the oscars for ecologists in central london i did the uh, the comparing and speaking to the ecologists prior to the, the the event it quickly became obvious to me that many of them are afraid to actually say what should be done you know they feel that we need to toe the line in order to keep our jobs yeah What's yeah. the point? Well, I mean, some would argue to keep their jobs. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know a lot of people who, who, you know, you meet on an individual basis, whether they work for a public agency or a large NGO, and you have a, a very, very diff different conversation with them privately, one to one, as you do when they're in a public arena. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, you know, the system that has straight jacketed many young um, ambitious conservationists is, 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 is restricting. There's no, no question about that. Um, yeah, anyway, we could, we could talk about that all night. And also the idea of planting trees. Um, I mean, I think that's been used as a greenwashing sort of uh, mechanism by some organizations. I mean, not conservation organizations, but corporate organizations, but that's not enough, is it? Because planting trees, it's more than that, isn't it? For example, your vision of Scotland is not about planting a bunch of pine trees. It's all about, as you say, natural regeneration. How can that happen in somewhere like southern England, which you know has hardly an inch of natural countryside anywhere? Well, I, I think that's, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not an expert in the in the the sort of uh, landscape use mosaic down in southern England, but but. You know, if you take somewhere like um, I'm, I'm picking one at random, South Downs National Park, um, you know, the landscapes there are cultural landscapes. They are preserved in stasis for that reason. They're not natural landscapes. They are managed in a way to keep them the way that we or, or certain people perceive they should be. So there's very little dynamism. Things like vegetation succession is suppressed. Very little... Um, natural processes are, are allowed to take place, predator-prey dynamics, etc. Now, you could argue that those ambitions are constrained by the, the amount of urban development in, the, in that area and the number of people, but you, you're absolutely right. You drew an analogy with places like Helsinki, Berlin. You know, that, that isn't an excuse in those countries. They are still able to live alongside some pretty extensive ranges of habitat in, in and, and that provide a home for some what we would perceive pretty dangerous animals um you know there are wild boar wandering around in the middle of berlin there are wolves as i mentioned there are wolves wandering around in the netherlands there are bears in finland there are lynx in sweden um why can't we well it's not that we can't it, it is that we won't um for all manner of of political and and social and cultural reasons so yeah, there's no there's no easy answers, there's no quick fixes to any of this. And I think, you know, I can see your frustration. And I think what happens is that you get frustrated and you start shouting at people and getting angry, and that that doesn't work. Yeah. So you've got to you've got to somehow bottle that frustration. I don't mean you, but one has to somehow bottle that frustration and try and use it constructively. Because I see every day on social media people shouting abuse at each other, and it simply takes us nowhere. Yes. So yeah, we've got to we've got to get cannier about how we manage this this process of transition of, of transformation. Do you think the brown bear to be reintroduced into UK is a step too far? Um, I think you've got to you've got to go for the low hanging fruit. And if we're talking about predators, then lynx is is absolutely the obvious one to go for. Um, we you know with rewilding, you could spend a huge amount of energy and time debating very polarized um debating very divisive species like wolves like bears 
there's a lot that can be done where that, that is low hanging fruit or common ground and, and habitat restoration of, of various at various scales and in various settings is one. If you're talking about species reintroductions, to me, beaver is a no brainer. In terms of bang for buck, beaver is the best animal we could have back, but also other species like cranes. And if we're talking about large predators, then lynx is, is by far and away the easiest in inverted commas, simply because as you rightly say, nobody will ever see one. Um, so they're much less intrusive and they've got much less cultural baggage than, than wolves, for example. So if you could be anywhere on this planet, Peter, at this moment, where would you be? Oh, um, well, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to travel reasonably extensively and, and seen some fantastic places. But I have to say, um, where I'd be is right here. And the reason, the reason in the Scottish Highlands, the reason I say that is that I'm able to tell more compelling stories here simply because I know the place physically, culturally and politically. So, um, yeah, I, I would say I, I'm, I'm happy here. Good answer. And um, what in your wildest dreams would be the animal that you would like to have reintroduced into UK um, if you were given carte blanche and no one argued with you? And they've got Noah's Ark ready to bring all the animals over. <laughs> well, it, 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 in my wildest dreams, after a, a, a night on the, an, an alcoholic fueled night, um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to say wolves, because I think wolves, ecologically speaking, would make a massive difference, a massive difference. But realistically, um, you know, that's unlikely to happen anytime soon, if in my lifetime. Um, so yeah, pragmatically, I, I would say lynx. Lynx and the second one being a lot more beavers. Fine, fair enough. Well, Zoomers, just to let you know that this current series of In Conservation we will be coming to a close in this month. Um, I think we've got maybe one or two more um, and then we resume in October. So the next one actually is tomorrow night, same time, same place, um, with a guy called Richard Prum, Dr. Richard Prum, and he's all about sex something that we all like now and again. Um, he's going to talk about bird sex though. And he's going to be talking about the fact that as you know, is it actually all about beauty? Can animals and birds in particular actually choose to have sex as opposed to do it just to, to, uh, to raise, you know, to get chicks, you know, to get babies. So that would be an interesting conversation. He's a very charismatic American man. So we'll look forward to that tomorrow. Um, yeah, Peter, I just want to say it's been a real pleasure to see you. It's a shame I've not physically seen you. It's been maybe three or four years since I last saw you, but um, it's really good uh, for you to, for you to have come tonight and you know appreciate it. And thank you very much. Oh, pleasure. Thanks, guys. And Zoomers, once again, thank you very much for for watching. And uh, you know, if you've got questions, please you know not only answer ask your questions now live, but you can also ask questions. When you see it on youtube write it on the uh, on the on the uh, little area you can write questions on and also don't forget to subscribe so thank you very much i'm david lindo also known as the urban birder that was peter cairns and all i'm saying now is keep looking up <laughs>